What's up everybody and welcome to the second video of my What is Machine Learning series. In the previous video, I introduced you the Iceflower dataset and a made up scenario. In that scenario, I wanted you to imagine to be a flower grower and the problem you're trying to solve was to devise a method for those flower pickers to distinguish the very similar looking flowers so that they can sort them. And this way I showed how machine learning generally works. And the final result of this video was this overview diagram. And here we depicted the different types of machine learning that exist and the different elements that you need to make a machine learn. And in this part of the series, I'm going to talk about just one element of this diagram. And it's this one, the algorithm. In the previous video, I simply said, you show the algorithm a bunch of examples and that way it will somehow learn to predict the label of a specific example solely by looking at its features. And in this video and the next one, I'm going to cover what that learning process actually looks like. And the specific algorithm we're going to look at is the decision tree algorithm. And therefore, to first get an intuition about how decision trees generally work, I want you to imagine again that you're the flower grower and that you have to solve the same problem as in the previous video. But this time you're going to solve it without using any machine learning at all. So, just like in the previous video, you pick 50 flowers of each type yourself and you gather some data. And now, instead of using machine learning, you use this data and analyze it to see if you can find some patterns that might help the flower pickers to distinguish the different types of flowers. But before you start, you randomly pick out 20 flowers out of those 150 and those will serve as your first test case. With them, you can check if the patterns that you found in your analysis are actually valid and really help to distinguish the different types of flowers. So to start your analysis, one thing you could do is to calculate some statistics. For example, the mean of the different features with regards to the different types of flowers. And what you could see here, for example, is that the Aristosa flowers have a petal length that is much smaller than the petal length of the other two types. And the same is also true for the petal width. So with regards to the petal leaves, the Aristotosa flowers seem to have the smallest leaves out of those three types of flowers. But generally speaking, it's relatively difficult to detect such patterns just by looking at numbers. A better way for doing that is to visualize the data. So here you created a scatter plot depicting the features of the sepal leaves. So the sepal width and the sepal length. And as you can see, the Aristotosa flowers are clearly separated from the other two types. But the Versicolor and Virginica flowers, they are quite interspersed, so this plot is probably not very useful for deriving some roots for the flower pickers. And that's because you can't easily separate out areas where there's just one type of flower. And what I mean by that is, for example, here, at a sepal length of 7, above that, there are only blue dots. So what you could say to the flower picker is, for example, okay, check the petal, uh, the sepal length of the flower, and if it is above 7, then the flower clearly is an Iris virginica. But that's about it, what you can do with this graph. So let's have a look at the petal leaves. And here, the situation looks much better because the Aristotosa flower are also clearly distinguished from the other two types. But additionally, the Versicolor and Virginica flowers are also more clearly separated from each other. So let's stick with this plot for deriving some roots. And looking at the graph, one obvious first rule might be, okay, check the petal width of the flower. And if it is, let's say, smaller than 0.8, then the flower clearly is an Aristotosa. So let's add that decision boundary. And since all the dots to the left of this line are green, let's shade the whole area with a green color. And now if you pick a new flower and it falls somewhere into this, uh, this area, so if it has a petal width between 0 and 0 0.8 and a petal length between 1 and 7, then we're going to classify it as an Aristotosa. And now we only have to consider those remaining data points and see if we can find some similar decision boundaries in this area. So let's start with the petal width again. And this time the boundary clearly must be between those two points. So between 1.6 and 1.7. So let's add that. And similar as before, now all the dots to the right of this line are blue. So let's shade the area accordingly. And now to separate out those orange dots from the blue ones, we need to create a, a boundary along the petal length. 
and we must be right here at the panel length of 4.9. This way there are only orange dots in this area and we can shade it with an orange color. And now we are only left with this small area which hasn't been classified yet. And here we can add one or maybe even two additional boundaries, but we're not going to do that. And we're not going to do that because the goal of our analysis is to somehow capture general characteristics of Irisotosa flowers. So for example, that with, regards, with regard to the petal leaves, that the Irisotosa flowers have the smallest leaves, the versicolor kind of the middle ones, and the virginica flowers have the biggest leaves. And since there are not many flowers in this area, it's probably not very representative for iris flowers in general. So those are kind of outliers. Those blue dots, for example, are iris virginica flowers with a petal width that is slightly smaller than what is normal for iris virginica. So if you would make really intricate decision boundaries in this area, then we might include some information of those extreme examples into our decision-making process. And this is not very desirable if you want to capture general characteristics of iris flowers. But nevertheless, we have to classify this area in case a new flower falls into it. And since there are three blue dots and only one orange dot, it's much more likely to be in Iris Virginica. So we're going to, sh to shade this area with a blue color. And now we are done with our analysis and we can classify any flower that falls onto this diagram. So let's see how those decision boundaries classify our 20 test flowers. So here are those 20 flowers. And let's add the decision boundaries to see how they would be classified. And as you can see, those flowers over here would be classified as Iris Otosa, those as Iris Versicolor, and those as Iris Virginica. And now let's see what type of flower they actually are. And as you can see, those flowers that were classified as Iris Otosa are indeed Iris Otosa flowers. The same is also true for the Versicolor flowers. There is, however, one misclassification in the Virginica area. So let me remove the shading so it's easier to see. So this flower here is actually an Iris Versicolor, but it was classified as an Iris Virginica. So in total, 19 out of 20 flowers were classified correctly by those decision boundaries, which results in an accuracy of 95%. And you, as the flower grower, decide that this accuracy is high enough for you to implement this approach instead of training the flower pickers anew every season. And what you do is you simply give them such a diagram and they can use it just like we did to classify the flowers and then sort them. So we solved the same problem as in the previous video, but this time we didn't use any machine learning to do it. But as it turns out, what we did so far in this video is exactly how the decision tree algorithm works. In fact, we can even illustrate those decision boundaries as a decision tree. So as you remember, this was the first decision boundary. And here we ask if the pattern width is smaller or equal to 0.8. If it was smaller, then the flower is an Aristotosa. And if it is not smaller, then we need to check those other boundaries. And the second boundary was this one. And here we examined if the pattern length is, the pattern width is smaller or equal to 1.65. If it is not smaller, then the flower is an Iris Virginica. If it is smaller, then we need to consider this last boundary. And here we looked at the petal length. And if it is smaller than 4.9, then the flower is an Iris Versicola. If it is bigger, then it's an Iris Virginica. And now we can use this decision tree, just like the decision boundaries to classify any new unknown flower. So let's say, for example, that we pick a flower with those values. So first we need to check if the petal width is smaller than 0.8 and it's 1.1, so no, and we have to go this way. Then is it smaller than 1.65? Yes, it is. And lastly, is the petal length smaller or equal to 4.9? It's free, so yes, and we would classify this flower as an iris versi color. And now let's also see where this flower falls on this diagram and as expected, it falls in the versicolor area. And now let's finally check what type of flower it actually is. And indeed, it's an iris versicolor. So as you can see, those decision boundaries can be depicted as such a decision tree. And the process or algorithm we went through to create them looks something like this. So first, 
We need to check if the data is pure. If it is, then we classify it and stop, which means we don't have to consider those data points anymore. If it is not pure, then we need to find the best feature to split the data, and then we split it into two parts. One part contains the data points with values that are bigger, uh, that are smaller or equal to that feature, and the other part contains the data points that are bigger than this feature. And then we repeat this process for both parts, and we keep doing that until all parts are eventually pure and reach the stop field. So to see this process in action, let's quickly go through the creation of the decision boundaries again. So first, we need to check if the data is pure. This is not the case because there are three different classes, so we have to go this way. Then we need to find the best feature to split the data, and we said it would be a pattern width of 0 0.8. Then we split the data into two parts, and now for the data points with a pattern width that is smaller or equal to 0 0.8, so for this left side, we again check if the data is pure, and this time it is, so we can classify it and stop. And for the other part, the data is not pure because there are still two classes, so we have to split it again. And now for this part of the data, so for this right side, the data is pure and we can classify it. And the other part, so this area, is still not pure, so we need to split it again. And now for all the dots uh, below this line, so for this part of the data, the data is pure and we can classify it. And for the other part of the data, we reach a point where we deviated from this algorithm and our original analysis. Because actually, the data is still not pure, so we would have to split it again. But for the aforementioned reasons, we didn't do that. We could, however, easily implement that approach from our analysis into this algorithm, simply by adding another process right before we check if the data is pure. And what we could do, for example, is to check if there are more than five data points. If there are, then we simply follow the algorithm as before, and if there aren't, then we classify the data based on which class appears more often, or if the different classes appear equally often, then we simply randomly pick one. And since there are just four dots, we need to go this way and we can classify the data and stop. And now all the parts of the data have reached a stop field and the whole algorithm comes to a stop. So this is the specific algorithm we use to create those decision boundaries. But for the upcoming video, I'm not going to consider this part of the algorithm. And I'm just going to stick with this more basic version. And now the important question that we need to answer is, what does it actually mean to find the best feature to split the data? Because we did that kind of intuitively, but if we want an algorithm to automatically find those decision boundaries, then we need a metric that precisely tells us what the best feature is to split the data. And what such a metric could look like is the topic of the upcoming video. So thanks for watching and hopefully I will see you in the next video.